yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. And so America was again drawn into a world war. A war which it would fight in two theaters, Europe and the Pacific. In World War II, 464 soldiers, sailors, and Marines would perform actions earning them the Medal of Honor. Soldiers like Lieutenant Vernon Baker and Private Carlton Barrett earned those awards in the European theater of operations, fighting the German and Italian armies. Far away, yet part of the same war, other Americans performed acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty while facing a different enemy, Imperial Japan. These are the stories of the Medal of Honor. In December 1941, the westernmost U.S. outpost was in the Philippine Islands. 7,000 miles from San Francisco, 5,000 miles from Pearl Harbor, the capital of the Philippines is only 1,800 miles from Tokyo. The U.S. had maintained forces in the Philippines since 1898, including a substantial number of Filipino units. Yet, only Manila Bay had adequate fortifications. In 1941, Douglas MacArthur was working for the Philippine government, organizing the new Philippine army. With limited resources, the forces were neither as well trained nor as well equipped as he would have liked. At the end of July, President Roosevelt recalled MacArthur to active service in the U.S. Army made him Lieutenant General and named him Commander of U.S. Army Forces in the Far East. 
the Philippine forces were incorporated into the U.S. Army, and MacArthur prepared for invasion by Japan. An invasion that no one expected to happen in just a few short months. It was understood at the time that if America entered the war, it would focus the bulk of its resources on defeating Germany first. Forces in the Philippines would be focused on the Bataan Peninsula, with the rest of the Philippines reluctantly sacrificed. General MacArthur proposed a change to this plan, to instead build up significant forces in the Philippines. MacArthur's proposal was eventually approved, and plans were in motion to have the Philippine base equipped and ready by April 1942. Significant air power resources were in place in early December 1941, including 107 P-40 fighter aircraft and 35 B-17 Flying Fortress bombers. But the anti-aircraft artillery were antiquated and insufficient, as were the repair facilities. On December 8th, the Imperial Japanese forces struck the airbase on the Philippines. There had been much finger pointing and blame over the years regarding why the planes were on the ground when the word of the bombing at Pearl Harbor had already spread. But regardless of the reasons, the Japanese were able to destroy over half the Far East Air Force's planes on the first day of the war. With air superiority attained, the Japanese land forces began initial strikes on December 10th and a full-scale invasion on December 22nd. The inadequately trained and poorly equipped Filipino forces were unable to hold the invaders back. MacArthur realized that the defense of the Philippines had failed. He concentrated his forces on the Bataan Peninsula, effectively surrendering the rest of the Philippines. There, they regrouped for a last stand. The retreat to Bataan was a massive effort, but eventually 26,000 civilian refugees and 80,000 troops made it to the base. Unfortunately, there was not enough food to feed that many mouths. MacArthur's troops were forced to defend their shrinking territory on half rations. No help could get through from the U.S. James Cowan, a mechanic with the U.S. Air Corps, wrote later, There was no doubt in my mind that Bataan was to be our last battle. With the Japanese virtually in control of the South Pacific, I, I could see no way we could receive help. The only thing we could do was to fight as long as possible, slowing up the rampaging Japanese on their drive toward the Dutch East Indies. My life with an anti-aircraft company became one constant whirl of action, setting up the guns to protect bridges or other strategic points as our troops retreated to Bataan. We seemed to move all night and fire at the Jap planes all day. About all we could do was force them to fly higher because of our poor ammunition. Our rations became less and less as the weeks passed. We ate all the horses and mules from the 26th Cavalry. Even General Wainwright's champion jumper was sacrificed. In February 1942, with the Japanese closing in, President Roosevelt ordered MacArthur to escape to Australia. MacArthur at first considered resigning his commission and staying to fight, but his staff talked him out of it. On March 12th, MacArthur and a small group escaped on four PT boats. They were picked up by the U.S. Navy and eventually reached Australia. On arriving in Australia, MacArthur made his famous I shall return speech. The President of the United States ordered me to break through the Japanese lines and proceed from Corregidor to Australia for the purpose, as I understand it, of organizing the American offensive against Japan, a primary objective of which is the relief of the Philippines. I came through and I shall return. 
It would take years, but General MacArthur would return, and he would recapture the Philippines. He would also receive the Medal of Honor for his defense of the Philippines. In doing so, he became the first son of a Medal of Honor recipient to also be awarded the medal. His father, Arthur MacArthur Jr., was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions as a first lieutenant in the Civil War. Adjutant of the 24th Wisconsin Infantry, First Lieutenant Arthur MacArthur Jr. was an 18-year-old combat veteran fighting at Missionary Ridge, Tennessee on November 25, 1863. At the height of this terrific battle, Lieutenant MacArthur seized the colors of his regiment at a critical and desperate moment, rushed forward and planted them on the captured Confederate works at the crest of Missionary Ridge to rally the men of the 24th Wisconsin by shouting, On Wisconsin! He was made a breveted colonel in the Union Army the following year. Only 19 years old at the time, he became nationally recognized as the Boy Colonel. In 1944, America and her allies were on the road to making good on MacArthur's promise. They had already captured the Solomon Islands, the Gilbert Islands, and the Marshall Islands, and they moved to take control of the Mariana Islands. The capture of these islands would put Japan within the range of the new long-range B-29 bomber. 8,000 Marines landed on the island of Saipan on June 15, 1944. The following day, units from the Army's 27th Infantry Division joined the fight. Private Thomas Baker, with the 105th Infantry Regiment, was in one of those units. On June 19th, Baker and the rest of A Company were moving through mountainous terrain of Saipan when they were held up by small arms and automatic weapons fire coming from a strongly fortified position on a ridge. Private Baker, on his own, took up a bazooka and rushed toward the enemy fortification. Dodging heavy rifle and machine gun fire directed at him, he made it to within 100 yards of the enemy. He blasted the strong point in the enemy emplacement, allowing his company to assault the ridge. A few days later, the company advanced across an open field that was surrounded by obstructions that could conceal enemy forces planning an ambush. Baker volunteered to take a position in the rear to protect the company against any surprise attacks. He discovered two heavily fortified enemy positions which the company had passed by. On his own, he attacked and killed all 12 of the enemy soldiers in those emplacements. Moving further along the path taken by Company A, he found and eliminated six more enemy soldiers who had concealed themselves behind the American lines. By July 7th, the Japanese forces had nowhere left to retreat. The Japanese Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Saito ordered a final suicidal charge by all remaining forces. The perimeter where Baker was on duty was hit on three sides by thousands of Japanese. Baker was seriously wounded early in the attack, but he chose to remain on the line he continued firing into the enemy, sometimes as close as five yards away. When his rifle was empty, he continued to fight, using it as a club. Finally, when his weapon had been battered to uselessness, he was carried about 50 yards to the rear by one of his friends, and then that friend was wounded. Baker refused to allow his comrades to place themselves at further risk by helping him, and he refused to slow down their retreat. He said he would rather be left to die than risk the lives of any more of his friends. He asked for a pistol, which had eight rounds remaining. When last seen alive, Baker was propped against a tree, pistol in hand, 
calmly facing the foe. Later, Baker's body was found in the same position, gun empty, with eight Japanese lying dead before him. Thomas Baker received a posthumous promotion to sergeant. His actions earned him the Medal of Honor, presented on May 9th, 1945. One of the most iconic images of World War II is the photograph by Joe Rosenthal of the U.S. Marines raising the American flag at the island of Iwo Jima. That photograph was taken just days into a five-week battle that resulted in the American capture of the island. Private Wilson Douglas Watson was with the 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, 3rd Marine Division at Iwo Jima. He was designated as an automatic rifleman, giving him the responsibility for the Browning automatic rifle. During actions on February 26th through 27th, 1945, Watson's squad was pinned down by intense fire from enemy fortifications in the high rocky ridges and crags commanding the line of advance. On his own, Private Watson rushed one pillbox, firing his rifle to keep the enemy pinned down. When he was in position, he hurled a grenade inside. He then rushed to the rear of the fortification in order to kill the enemy's soldiers as they retreated. Watson's squad was now able to continue its advance. But they were pinned down once again at the foot of a small hill. Watson and his ammo bearer scaled the jagged incline under fierce mortar and machine gun barrages, firing from the hip as he climbed. From the reverse side of the hill, the Japanese soldiers attacked him with grenades and knee mortars. He stood fearlessly erect in his exposed position at the crest of the hill so that he could fire upon the enemy positions. For a harrowing 15 minutes, Private Watson held the hill under withering fire, killing 60 enemy soldiers before his ammunition was exhausted and the rest of his platoon could join him. Following that, he took out two more enemy positions, rescuing four Marines who'd been pinned down by their fire. Over the two-day period, Private Watson single-handedly eliminated 90 enemy soldiers, becoming known as the One Man Regiment. On October 5, 1945, President Truman presented him with the Medal of Honor. John R. McKinney, called J.R. by his family, grew up hunting and fishing in Woodcliffe, Georgia. He was 20 years old when the Imperial Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor. He and his brothers joined the army soon after. J.R. landed in the 123rd Infantry Regiment of the 33rd Infantry Division. After training in the desert of California and in the jungles of the Hawaiian island of Kauai, they spent six months walking patrol and providing security in New Guinea. Then, in January 1945, they were shipped out to the Philippines. MacArthur was returning. J.R. McKinney's 123rd Regiment landed in Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines, in February 1945. Over the next several months, they and other American units, combined with Filipino troops, succeeded in recapturing the island. Late in the campaign, the 123rd was tasked with security operations at the installations at Dingalon Bay on the eastern side of Luzon. While in Dingalon Bay, Private McKinney was one of several men who manned a machine gun emplacement protecting the defensive perimeter. At 5.30 a.m. on May 11, 1945, McKinney had just been relieved from his night-long duty on the gun. He'd settled into the tent that he shared with two Filipino guerrillas and was just drifting off to sleep, his M1 Garand rifle cradled in his arms. He was awakened by the ruffling sound 
of his tent flap being opened. Thinking some of his buddies were playing a prank, he was surprised when the flaps flew open to reveal a Japanese Imperial Army soldier, sword in hand. The soldier swung the sword at McKinney's head, but only managed to slice through a bit of scalp and part of McKinney's ear. McKinney was stunned, but his training kicked in immediately. He rammed the butt of his rifle straight up into his attacker's chin. And when the soldier fell, McKinney followed up with another strike, crushing the enemy's skull. Another Japanese soldier rushed in, bayonet first. McKinney shot him in the chest. As he struggled to make sense of what had just happened, gunshots outside his tent made it clear. The camp was under attack. McKinney rushed out of his tent. He could hear fighting to the north, but his responsibility was the southern perimeter, and the machine gun there wasn't firing. In the dim light, he looked over at the machine gun pit. He could see men ripping away the camouflage, struggling to maneuver the machine gun. Japanese soldiers trying to turn the gun to fire into the camp. McKinney fired his rifle, killing the two men. He then spotted two more Japanese nearby, moving towards the command tent. They spotted him in the same moment, but McKinney fired first. Two headshots, and the enemy's soldiers were down. He looked again at the machine gun, still unmanned. He couldn't let the enemy seize it and turn it against the American and Filipino forces. McKinney rushed to the machine gun as the sounds of battle to the north grew louder. Two American soldiers were down near the machine gun pit. One was seriously wounded and the other, Private First Class Morris Roberts, was trying to move the wounded man to safety. The Filipino guerrillas who had been with them had vanished, perhaps to join the explosive battle on the northern perimeter. McKinney was still on his own. Private First Class Adolf Barrett was a rifleman assigned to help protect mortars located at the rear of the machine gun emplacement. He reported what he saw. McKinney started dragging the gun to the rear so the attackers couldn't turn it on us. One of the gunners had been shot and the other was trying to evacuate him. I saw about 10 Japs armed with rifles, bayonets, and long pointed poles rush to position, but I was afraid to shoot into the group for fear of hitting one of my buddies. Then I was confronted by the infiltrating Japs trying to get at our mortars. Soon, I heard shrieks and screams and moans of the enemy coming from McKinney's direction. Ten Imperial Japanese soldiers swarmed toward, then into the machine gun pit. Private Roberts later described what he saw while he tried to aid his wounded comrade. McKinney fired a short burst, killing the first two attackers. Then the place seemed to swarm with Japs shooting one, bashing another with his rifle butt, kicking another, then dragging at the machine gun. He attracted enough attention to enable me to get the wounded man back to a covered position for first aid. In the fight, the machine gun itself was jammed. McKinney now had only his rifle to fight off the enemy coming at him in waves. As the Japanese hurled grenades and directed knee mortar shells into the perimeter he defended, McKinney responded with accurate rifle fire, taking them down one by one. He kept moving, changing position and collecting more ammunition. Whenever his weapon ran out of ammo, he reversed it and clubbed the attackers to death with the rifle butt. At one point, he witnessed four Japanese soldiers moving near the position where he knew Private Roberts was caring for the wounded soldier. McKinney leapt from hiding, putting himself between the enemy and his friends. He shot three of the soldiers, reloaded, and shot the fourth before they were able to respond. 
for more than 30 minutes, Private J.R. McKinney waged a private war against overwhelming odds. He is officially credited with the deaths of 40 enemy soldiers, but some reports suggest the number was much higher. Finally, the attack on the northern perimeter was broken, and American soldiers there rushed to the southern perimeter to aid in its defense. When they arrived, they found a beach covered with the bodies of the enemy. Technical Sergeant Alfred Johnson described the scene. We found McKinney in a firing position at his machine gun, bleeding from his left ear and breathing hard. He assured us he was all right. There were 38 freshly killed Japs piled two and three deep on their approach to the emplacement and around the gun, and two more lay near the knee mortar. Searching the bodies for documents, we found many cracked skulls and body contusions where McKinney's rifle butt and kicking feet had done their work. For his actions that day, J.R. McKinney was promoted to sergeant, and on January 23, 1946, he was presented the Medal of Honor in a White House ceremony. As he placed the medal around Sergeant McKinney's neck, President Truman remarked, there is no greater honor in the world. To tell you the truth, I'd rather have earned one of these than be president. Medal of Honor recipients like Thomas Baker, Wilson Watson, and John McKinney earned their awards by making bold assaults on the enemy at tremendous personal risk. Others have earned their awards by risking and often losing their own lives in order to save the lives of their comrades. Private George Watson of the 29th Quartermaster Regiment was on board a ship at Porlock Harbor in New Guinea when it was attacked by enemy bombers on March 8, 1943. The order was given to abandon ship. When Private Watson was still in the water, he saw several fellow soldiers who could not swim. Rather than swim to safety, Watson stayed in the water. He saved the lives of several comrades who would have drowned. At the time, Private George Watson was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. He was the first African American in World War II to be awarded that medal, the second highest award for valor. For more than 50 years, no African Americans from World War II were awarded the Medal of Honor. In 1993, the Army asked North Carolina's Shaw University to study the issue and determine if there was any racial disparity in the selection of Medal of Honor recipients. Shaw found that such a disparity did exist. They identified 10 soldiers who'd received the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest award for valor, and recommended that they be considered for an upgrade to Medal of Honor. The Army reviewed the 10 cases, and seven of the soldiers were determined to have earned the nation's highest award for valor. Because the statutory time limit for presentation had passed, special legislation was required to allow the president to present the medals. And on January 13th, 1997, President Bill Clinton presented the seven awards. One of the seven men who finally received the recognition earned over 50 years earlier was Private George Watson. World War II brought a new level of attention to the Medal of Honor. Many recipients came back to the U.S. during the war to promote war bonds, and in the process, they were promoted as celebrities. As a result, the Medal of Honor took on a new significance in the society at large. The new recipients, particularly the survivors, became heroes to a nation that was coming out of decades of depression and war, a nation that was looking for heroes. Some recipients became the subjects of books and movies. The most famous, of course, was Audie Murphy. A year after World War II, in 1946, 
the Medal of Honor Society was created. Its membership is limited to those who have received the nation's highest award for valor in combat. Its purpose is to promote the ideals embodied in the medal. In 1958, President Eisenhower signed legislation chartering the organization now named the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. The society would work to promote patriotism, protect its members from exploitation, and assist Medal of Honor recipients, their families, and their widows. World War II also brought some changes to the medal itself, the physical manifestation of the nation's gratitude and of the honor due to its most valorous combat heroes. This was the latest modification of a medal that was first created in the Civil War by men who could not know the importance that it would one day hold. The Navy's Medal of Honor was actually created first, followed soon after by the Army. The Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, directed the Philadelphia Mint to make the medal. A Philadelphia firm, William Wilson & Sons, came up with a design that in many ways is similar to the one awarded to modern recipients. The original medal was an inverted five-pointed star. Within each point of the star, a cluster of laurel and oak leaves represent symbols of victory and strength. In the center of the star, Minerva, Roman goddess of battle wisdom, banishes a man representing discord. Minerva and discord are surrounded by 34 stars, one for each state, including those in rebellion. In this simple design, the wisdom and valor of the Union's heroic soldiers would banish the discord and strife that was tearing the young nation apart. The same design was used for both the Navy and Army medals, with small differences. The Navy medal was suspended from a red, white, and blue ribbon by an anchor wrapped in rope. The ribbon holding the Army medal hung from an eagle which sat upon a cannon and brandished a saber. In 1904, General George Gillespie made changes to the design of the Army Medal. In this design, the image of Minerva banishing discord was replaced with a profile of the goddess. The 34 stars were replaced with the words, United States of America. The eagle now perched upon the word, Valor. The oak and laurel leaves were colored green and the laurels were now shaped as a wreath. The ribbon it hung from was now blue with 13 white stars. The Navy made changes too, though they did not last. The Navy awarded the Medal of Honor for non-combat heroism, such as repeatedly entering a burning ship to rescue fellow sailors, as well as valor in combat. Between 1919 and 1942, the Navy Medal of Honor for non-combat heroism was the Maltese Cross, called the Tiffany Cross because it was designed by Tiffany and Company. The design was not popular and was retired in 1942. From that point forward, the Navy has used its original medal design, though it also hangs from a blue ribbon with 13 white stars. During World War II, the practice of draping the Medal of Honor around the recipient's neck became common. The medal hangs from a small blue pad which bears 13 white stars and that pad is attached to blue silk ribbon worn around the neck. This is the medal as we know and recognize it today. The only award in the U.S. military that is worn around the neck rather than pinned to the recipient's uniform. In 1965, the Air Force created its own Medal of Honor. Similar in appearance to the Army Medal, though it is larger and replaces the profile of Minerva with the one of the Statue of Liberty. The Air Force coat of arms replaces the Army's eagle. Together, these three medals are the highest awards prevented for military service, and they identify their bearers as men who acted with a gallantry and valor above and beyond the call of duty. Beginning in World War II, 
Over half of all medals of honor have been awarded posthumously. As the medal has gained prestige, the criteria for earning it have grown. And as our weapons have become more powerful, the likelihood of surviving a Medal of Honor action has gone down. But there are still soldiers and sailors and Marines whose courage is so great, whose love of their comrades is so strong that they are driven to actions so daring that they are difficult to believe. Actions they might not survive, but which might allow their fellows to live to fight another day. These are actions earning them the Medal of Honor.